continue off really quickly. We're going to jump right straight to it. And we're going to go really, really quickly. We're not making a lot of time. So I'm going to go really, really quickly with this. This is in the book Prophets and Kings. I left you off with the, the last place we left off. And we were looking at um, 19MR336.3. period three. That's in, you got to go to the egwwritings.org. egwwritings.org. E-G-W-W-R-I-T-I-N-G-S dot O-R-G. Period. Do, period. O-R-G. That was okay. Well, and there you would type in in the search engine one nine MR space three three six period three one one. I mean, no, let me say that again one nine MR space three three six period three. And we read just paragraph three and paragraph four. And it's paragraph four what it mentioned that you would be in you will in the future be expected to conform to the observance of various hol holidays various holidays you will be in the future be expected to conform to the observance of various holidays watchers will be set that means people around you watchers will be set to seek occasion of complaints against the commandment keep keeping people of god okay well, let's go to the next statement. Seeing this idea of being conformed, being forced to conform to the world's holidays. Let's continue. Um, go to back to the search engine. Put P K space five seven zero period one. And we're gonna look at this. Just like the previous that previous statement we saw. Let's look at this. Starting, thou shalt make no covenant with them. God had said, and those who had recent, wait, thou shalt make no covenant with them. Who's he talking about? The world, you're going to see. Now we shouldn't make a covenant with the world. Thou shalt make no covenant with them. This is Prophets and Kings, page 570, paragraph 1. This is an important book. Thou shalt make no covenant with them. God had said, and those who had recently rededicated themselves, wait, God had said that, pardon me. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, God had said, and those who had recently rededicated themselves to the Lord at the altar, set up before the ruins of his temple, the altar set up before the ruins of his temple, realized that the line of demarcation between his people and the world is ever to be kept unmistakably distinct. A line of demarcation is like a line of separation. The line of demarcation between his people and the world is ever to be kept unmistakably distinct. Unmistakably distinct. They refuse to enter into alliance with those who vote familiar, listen to this, who vote familiar with the requirements of God's law would not yield to its claims. So there's people on this other side who are in the world who, who though they're familiar with the requirements of God's law, they refuse to yield to the law of God's claims. What is she talking about? Not just the Ten Commandments, but the whole law of God, the law of Moses, those specifications, those requirements. That's that we, we, you desperately need that in the context of the cross and Jesus' righteousness to understand the message of righteousness by faith. You desperately need that. Christ's righteousness. His blood shed for you. His life taking place for you. Well, let's continue. The principles set forth in Deuteronomy for the instruction of Israel are to be followed by God's people to the end of time. True prosperity is dependent on the continuance of our covenant relationship with God. Never can we afford to compromise 
principle by entering into alliance with those who do not fear him, those who do not fear God. There is constant there's constant danger that professing Christians will come to think that in order to have influence with worldlings, that means the world, in order to have influence with worldlings, they must to a certain extent conform to the world. That means be like the world or form themselves like with the world. But, so what is she talking about? She's talking about a lot of things. She's talking about a lot of things, and you'll see, she's going to say this again, you'll see that she's talking about the customs, the traditions, the holidays, everything, the way they act, think, whatever, that the world does, we should not conform with that. Something I forget to share, we talked about Antichrist, how there's a power, a kingdom, system that is against God and against God's people, against God and in the place of God, trying to be in the place of God. Something I forgot to mention the world is at enmity against God. What does the scripture says? Friendship with the world is enmity against God. That means there's a there's a strife, there's a division, there's a contest, there's a there's um some conflict even. Where that if you align yourself with the world, the Lord will be against you and you will be against the Lord. You'll find yourself in that position. That's another name of Antichrist in the place of God in the place of Christ and against Christ. Okay. Well, let's continue. So we read about who though familiar to so their people who though familiar with the requirements of God's law would not yield to its claims. Interesting. Mm -mm -mm. And then what did she, what did she say? Never can we into the next paragraph, paragraph two, skipping ahead. Never can we afford to compromise principle by entering into alliance with those who do not fear him. Paragraph three. Now, continuing, starting here. There's constant danger that professing Christians will come to think that in order to have influence with worldlings. They must, to a certain extent, conform to the world. That sounds like our holidays. We want to try to teach Christ through the holidays. But though such a course may appear to afford great advantages, what did she say? But though such a course may appear, it may appear to afford great advantages, it always ends in spiritual loss. Against every subtle influence that seeks entrance by means of flattering inducements from the enemies of truth, God's people must strictly guard, must strictly guard, meaning guard themselves. How? By the law. We must strictly guard by the law and by the word of God. They are pilgrims and strangers in this world. Traveling a path beset with danger to the to the in, ingenious subterfuges and alluring inducements held out to tempt from allegiance, they must give no heed. They must give no heed to those speaking of those alluring inducements, those things trying to induce you into such a way or such a manner. Held out to tempt, so on. Mm -mm. Tempt them unto allegiance. They, we, we can't give any heed. That's what she means when she says tempt from allegiance, from the idea of having allegiance. They must give no heed. So what did she say in paragraph one? She said to God's people recommending that, and I'm skipping ahead, the world is ever to be kept unmistakably distinct. The world. 
They, speaking of God's church, refuse to enter into alliance with those, speaking of the world. They, God's church, refuse to enter into alliance with those of the world, who, though familiar with the requirements of God's law, would not, would not yield to its claims. So what's the solution? We then need to yield only unto the Lord and his law's requirements. The law of Moses, the full law, including unto his Bible feast days. And doing this, it will keep us separate and spiritually, what did it say? Spiritually guarded. That's how we should deal with the other nations. Remember in the law of Moses, we discussed about the law of Moses and how it's it's, uh, it guards us and how also it teaches us how to deal with one another, deal with our brethren, and how to, um, it shows us that we should, um, it keeps us separate away from the other nations and so on, so that we don't become like those other nations. We talked a lot on that, on brief on that, but that's what keeps us, that's what identifies us, just like it identified Israel uh, when they left Egypt. The Lord gave them his law, and he became a holy people, and they, they had to become separate from all the nations. All the nations were surrounding them, but the Lord made clear, do not be like those other nations, those pagan and heathen and sinning, those evil nations. Do not be like them. Keep to the law of God, and keep pure, keep holy, keep to the commandments, and everything will be good with you. So it will keep us separate and spiritually guarded, yielding to his law, only yielding to him, to the Lord Almighty and his law's requirements and unto his Bible feast days. And that whole law, it will keep us separate and spiritually guarded. For instance, in Zechariah 14, Zechariah 14, for instance, God's city temple, you know, where we're protected in worshiping God and we're celebrating in the Feast of Tabernacles and we are preserved from those armies, from the wicked's armies. Not only that, it's found in Revelation. Our worship unto the Lord, worshiping God, the enemy gets jealous. The enemy stirs up the world and gets jealous and they try to attack us. They try to put us to death. So it's our worship, our genuine worship, which will anger the nations. But this worship keeps us in line and in check with the Lord. Worshiping God, celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, we are preserved from the Babylon's armies, which you find in Revelation for Armageddon, which are of Gog and Magog. I'm implying, I'm pointing to Revelation 16 and, and also chapter 20 and also Zechariah chapter 14. Let me go to the next statement. So guarded away from the world's confusion and sensual sins, their holidays and their practices and customs, basically. Um, oh, pardon me. I'm, I'm, I'm commenting. This is my next note. I'm just talking. Talking on this because we need to dwell on this and understanding what is what is it that we're facing against. And so, what is it? Will God's laws and methods work to defend us against apostate Protestantism and the world? Well, Ellen White's counsel says that the Lord says yes repetitively to this question. I've shown this. We've seen this already. Uh, go to 6 T. Space three nine period three six T space three nine period three. I'm gonna read this really quick. I'm gonna break down this sentence. It says, Anciently, the Lord instructed his people to assemble three times a year. Remember all those camp meeting statements? Anciently, the Lord instructed his people to assemble three times a year for his worship to these holy convocations. Speaking of the feasts. The children of Israel came. I'm going to skip ahead. Dot, 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 dot. 
Thus, they were to be preserved from the corrupting power of worldliness and idolatry. It's quite clear what by faith and love and gratitude were to be kept alive in their hearts and through their association together in this sacred service, they were to be bound closer to God and to one another. So this is what preserves us. This is what keeps us safe. Let's go to another place. Uh, just scroll down to to um, page 40, paragraph 2. Oh, page 40, paragraph 1. I'm going to skip ahead. 4-0, period 1. Skipping ahead, is go to the place where it says, The Lord saw that these gatherings were necessary for the spiritual life of his people. They needed to turn away from their worldly cares, their worldly cares, to commune with God and to contemplate unseen realities. Um, going to the next page, paragraph to the next, my fault, not page, paragraph. Pardon me. Four zero period two. If the children of Israel needed the benefits of these holy convocations in their time, how much more do we need them in these last days of peril and conflict? So what's the point of all of this? We must clear away. We must keep clear away. Keep clear away separate from apostate Protestantism and those of the world. Who are holding on the name of Christ by way through these worldly holidays. There will be many false Christs, Jesus warned us. Many false Christs. Those of apostate Protestantism and those of the world who are holding on the name of Christ by way through these worldly holidays. Many false Christs. Let's go to this next statement. Now we're going to the great controversy. Great Controversy, page 508, paragraph 2. Go to G, C. What is that? G, C. G as in great, C as in controversy. Space 508, period 2. And what does it say? Ellen White says in the Great Controversy, according to this context strong, she says Satan is continually... Seeking to overcome the people of God by breaking down the barriers. What are the barriers? It's God's law that guards us. Not only does it guard the Ten Commandments, which are moral, but it also guards us. I shared that already in previous videos. Satan is continually seeking to overcome the people of God by breaking down the barriers which separate them from the world. God's word. God's law, his covenant, all those things, the Lord's feasts even, all those things, Satan wants to destroy it. Why? Because he wants to put himself in the place of that and come against it and, and is coming against it. Let's continue. Now it speaks about ancient Israel. Ancient Israel were enticed into sin when they ventured into forbidden association with the heathen, meaning the pagan or the worldly person. Now look at this. In a similar manner are, and she's speaking about today, in a similar manner are modern Israel, speaking about today, led astray of the church, speaking of the church today. Modern Israel led astray. Continuing, now she's speaking about Satan here. Satan, the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not. Speaking about Satan, the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light, the what? The light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. What did that statement, remember the statement we read uh, before where it said, um, where it said that there is light still to come forth from the law of God and from the gospel of righteousness. Remember she said that? Ellen White? Well, this is the, the beautiful gospel. This is the true and the full and the, the magnified gospel. 
the gospel of Christ's righteousness. Well, minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So these persons are blind. And she's quoting 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. All who are not decided followers of Christ are servants of Satan. In the unregenerate heart, there is love of sin and a disposition to cherish and excuse it. In the renewed heart, there is hatred. Now, this is of God's people. In the renewed heart, there is hatred of sin and determined resistance against it. When Christians choose the society of the ungodly and unbelieving, they expose themselves to temptation. Satan conceals himself from view and stealthily draws his deceptive covering over their eyes. They cannot see that such company, such company of the world that is, such company, they cannot see that such company is calculated to do them harm. And while the, all the time, and while all the time assimilating to the world in character, what three ways? In character, words, and actions. This is how you conform to the world. And watch, he says that assimilating, coming unto the word, this is that alliance we're speaking about. Assimilating to the world in character, words, and actions. That's the way how you conform into the world. They are becoming more and more blinded, his people, unfortunately. Because they associate themselves with the world. Conformity. Conformity. And this is, this should be the very next, the very next paragraph. 501 period 1. Conformity to worldly customs. What does it say? Conformity to worldly, what word is that? Conformity. Just like assimilating. Conformity to worldly customs converts the church to the world, it never converts the world to Christ. So what is she speaking about? Not just your generic custom, she's also pointed to those holidays which have a Christian element that we feel so tempted and obliged to use and to try to reach and to minister into the world year after year. Like Christmas, for instance. Like uh, even Easter, for instance, like um, even what Valentine's Day, maybe, or it, any other day, who knows? Maybe you're, maybe you're doing practicing Halloween, even. She's quite clear. Conformity to worldly customs converts the church to the world. It never, underline never, converts the world to Christ. Familiarity with sin will inevitably cause it to appear less repulsive. You'll get that means you'll get familiar with sin. It gets more more nice. It's not repulsive anymore. It's more nice. It's more comfortable. Familiarity with sin will inevitably cause it to appear appear less repulsive. He who chooses to associate with the servants of Satan will soon cease to fear their master. When in the way, speaking of the Lord, our master, when in the way of duty we are brought into trial, as was Daniel in the king's court, we may be sure that God will protect us. But if we place ourselves under temptation, we shall fall sooner or later. She's quite clear. Remember we read about earlier, we read about earlier Satan's harvest seasons. Look at this language here, right here. Scroll up, go to R H space June space 20th 20 space or pardon, let me do that again. R H space J U N E that's for June, comma, ah, I keep doing that, no, no comma after, no comma after June, space two zero, comma, space 
1882. That's R H space J U N E space 20 comma space 1882 and go to that and scroll down to paragraph 14 so remember we read scroll down to paragraph 14 remember we read about Satan's harvest seasons before we read about it elsewhere well Here we're going to learn to not sow spiritually to the flesh, but rather we should sow to the Holy Spirit. We should sow to the Spirit. Let's read. Would that I could lead every professed follower of Christ to see this matter as it is. We are all sowing, I mean sowing seed. We are all sowing either to the flesh or to the Spirit. And we reap... The harvest from the seed we sowed. In choosing our pleasures or employments, we should seek only those things that are excellent. Now she's speaking about the world here. The trifling, the trifling, the worldly, the debasing should have no power to control the affections or the will. What did she say? The trifling, the worldly, the debasing should have no power to control the affections or the will. The great apostle declared that he kept his body under, and this discipline must be maintained by every follower of Christ. Let's continue. The bondage of worldly habits and customs is so pleasing to the natural heart that it has become well nigh universal well nigh universal few few can be found what she's speaking what context she's speaking to in this universal context of how the worldly habits and customs are everywhere she says in this universal um contest She's, she's saying this. Listen to this. Well, now universal. Few. Speaking of God's people. Few can be found who are willing to deny self that they may walk in the light of heaven. It is because they know not Christ and obey not the truth. That professed Christians can accept as their portion the pleasures of of sense and the changing fashions of a fickle world. Not one of those who have come out, not listen to that, not one of those who have come out from the world in obedience to the injunctions, injunctions of Christ can find pleasure in its amusements or its display. Many are saying by their course of action that the line of demarcation, you remember that? That the line of demarcation between Christians and the world must not be too distinct. So their actions are showing this, that they're, they're more friendly with the world. They're already having two feet, you know, one foot on one side and one foot on the other. That line of demarcation is no longer as distinct. It's as if removed. And you can tell by their actions. Many are saying by their course of action that the line, by their course of action that the line of demarcation between Christians and the world must not be too distinct. They conform, there's the word again, they conform to the customs and unite in the pursuits of the lovers of pleasure in order to retain their friendship, their friendship, and exert an influence to win them to the truth. So we're still trying to evangelize them according to a worldly context, through their worldly customs, through their worldly practices. What was it that we, we saw before? 
We saw already about the their, how we assimilate to the world, how we conform to the world and its customs. It was by character, by words, and by actions. That's how you become like someone. By character, by words, and actions. Great Controversy, page 508, paragraph 2 said. But So what are they doing here? They're still trying to evangelize the world by the principles of the world, which is interesting. Sounds definitely like Christmas. Sounds definitely like Easter. Let's continue. I'm going to read this again so you can hear this. They conform to the customs and unite in the pursuits of the lovers of pleasure in order to retain their friendship. Grenanti Ellen speaks about free loveism in the last days. Free loveism. It's a cheap love even. To retain their friendship and exert an influence to win them to the truth. The plea is not new. You hear what she says? This plea, the plea is not new. The same work has been often attempted since the opposing forces of good and evil first existed in the world. Since the beginning of the creation of this earth, even earlier, since Satan's rebellion, Lucifer's rebellion, Hillel's rebellion, the devil's rebellion in heaven, Lucifer and Hillel, he became Satan and the deceiver, the devil. It's as Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes says, there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. How everything just repeats and repeats and repeats. How everything just repeats. Well, let's just continue. Since it first existed in the world, this great controversy she's pointing to, the result has ever been the same. Wow. Let's read that again. The same work has often has been often attempted since the opposing forces of good and evil first existed in the world. The result has ever been the same. Nothing has changed. The result has ever been the same. The church always conforms to the customs to try to make a friendship, an ecumenical feeling. And this is what has repeatedly destroyed the church. Balaam, in the book of Numbers, with, uh, with uh, Moab, what did he try to do? What did he try to do? He tried to associate... Uh, the, the, the Moabitess woman with Israel. Again, there's that familiarity. Not only that, they started eating the same foods. Revelation chapter 2 tells us how they're eating food sacrificed to idols. You're eating the same foods, you start... What? Idolatry. Just like in the book of Numbers. Not only that, sexual immorality through the, the, alert, through the seduction of harlots... Revelation 2 tells us, and the book of Numbers also tells us, that's what caused Israel to, to be put down, to sin. Conformity to worldly, there's that word again, conformity. Conformity. She keeps saying it. She keeps saying the world's customs. She keeps saying... Either the world's holidays or the customs or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. She keeps saying these same words. This is what's what she how she holds these words in her mind, in her definition. She knows what she's speaking to. Conformity to worldly customs converts the church to the world. Converts the church to the world. It never converts the world to Christ. It's as simple as that. It never converts the world to Christ. The friendship of the world is enmity with God. 
Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Just like Satan. Satan means adversary. Let's continue. How can the loyal subjects of the great king be in harmony with his bitterest foe? When the professed people of God choose, this is a choice, when the professed people of God choose the fellowship of the world, what marvel that the presence and blessing of Christ is shut out from the church? Let's continue. In the fear of God, whom I love and whom I serve, I call upon the followers of Christ to come out from the world. Come out from the world. The world is Babylon. Is is Babylon. Come out from the world. If they would but be men of principle and determination and moral power, there are many who might become polished instruments in the hand of Christ. But if they at times, guess what? If they at times yield themselves to the control of, is that word again to the control of Satan they cannot be trusted he who does not re himself resist inclination or who has not a proper understanding of Christian obligation would be an unsafe guide to others one one injudicious act may exert an influence which the most earnest effort will be powerless to counteract. So notice what paragraph 15 said. This sort of ecumenical holiday way of teaching, uh, teaching Christ to worldly peoples. What does, she, what does Ellen White say about it? This, this way of teaching Christ in an ecumenical holiday way, a worldly custom, customed way. What does she say about it? She says, it never, it never converts the world to Christ. It never converts the world. Never converts the world. It never converts the world to Christ. So this is my comment on it. She's all, by all evidence, talking about repetitively, chiefly Christmas, Easter, and all other worldly holidays that we might try to seek to introduce Christ in. She's chiefly speaking about these customs, these days, these holidays. I believe it. Lastly, finishing with this warning from Ellen White. Go to go to five T space eight zero. Period one five T space eight zero period one. This is a warning. I'm gonna lastly finish with this. I'm gonna skip ahead. I'm gonna skip ahead. What does it say? Go to they are self sufficient. This is the issue. Of all of us, this is the issue, and also apost this is the issue of apostate Protestantism, and this is the issue that's beginning with us even, and pervading with us. And we have to be careful. It's every one of us. I want you to know that every one of us. What does this say? What does this say? They are self-sufficient, independent of God. What did she say? Self-sufficient. This sounds like Laodicea, comfortable. They think they see. They think they're rich. They think they're clothed. Everything. They won't receive anything of Christ. They are self-sufficient, independent of God. And he cannot use them. The Lord has faithful servants who in the shaking testing time will be disclosed to view. 
There are precious ones now hidden who have not bowed the knee to Baal. They have not had the light which has been shining in a concentrated blaze upon you. But it may be under a rough and uninviting exterior, the pure brightness of a genuine Christian character will be revealed. In the daytime, we look toward heaven. And I pray all of this. This is what you should be seeing. The righteousness of Christ. Righteousness by faith. Coming back unto the law of God, unto the word of God. Coming back unto the cross. Christ crucified. Falling in love with him again. And developing Christ in us. The hope of glory. That's what we need. Over and over, I've been trying to repeatedly emphasize that in contrast to having Satan being a minister, being a minister or a disciple of Satan. No, we need to be a disciples of Christ, his every word. So a genuine Christian character will be revealed. In the daytime, we look toward heaven, but do not see the stars. They are there fixed in the firmament. But the eye cannot distinguish them. In the night we behold their genuine luster. She's talking about these, these certain Christians. This genuine Christian character. Under a rough and uninviting exterior. But they have that pure brightness of a genuine Christian character. To, to be revealed. Let's continue. The time. What does it say? And the oh. This is in 81, paragraph 1. Forgive me, I didn't write this down on my notes right. It should be the next page, I believe. What does it say? 8-1, period 1. The time is not far distant when the test... The time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. The mark of the beast will be urged upon us. Those who have... Step by step, yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs, will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be. Rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment, and death. The contest is between what? The contest is between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. What is that? God's law versus Satan's law. God's days versus Satan's days. God's worship versus Satan's worship. God's kingdom versus Satan's kingdom. This is her language. This is what she's pointing to. This is what's in her mind, in her heart, what she understands. She knows what God's law is. It's all this, more than many understood. She knows what, um, she knows what uh, God's feasts are and what they do, that they're for mission and that they help us to keep us separate and distinct and, and away from the worldly influence. She knows that. But yet, if you fall for the worldly customs, if you fall for those worldly days even, those customs and those practices, what was it? Character, actions, and words. What was it? What was it that we saw? Assimilating to the world in character, words, and actions. They are, be they are becoming more and more blinded. Great Controversy, page 508, paragraph 2 said. So what did she say? There's a test. It'll come to every soul. The mark of the beast, it'll be urged upon us. Those who have step by step. Notice all of these words are, have been repetitive in each of the passages that I shared with you. Yielded. Whether you're yielding to God and his law or you're yielding to Satan. Whether he's trying to control you or as here, there's a demand against you or there's a... There's many different words that were used for it where there's a sense of coercion about it. What else? Conformed. 
conforming or, or assimilating or coming near unto the world, becoming like the world. Worldly customs is tied unto the worldly holidays. Over and over and over we saw those type of customs. Those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be. That sounds like following every wind of doctrine that just happens to be going on. Rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment, and death, the contest is between what? The commandments of God and the commandments of men. The whole law of God, including the feast, which is the seal of God, versus the whole commandments of men, including the worldly holidays, which is according to Satan's throne and his kingdom. I'm going to share more of this the more plainly about the seal of God versus the mark of the beast in the video. In my Sunday Law of They've Existed playlist in my um, elsewhere, in my prophecy subsection on my homepage. And this time, listen to this, there's a test, there's the contest. What's going on? In this time, what, she, what did she say in the beginning of the passage? The time is not far distant. When? And now she's saying here, in this time, the gold will be separated from the dross in the church. The gold will be separated from the dross in the church. True godliness... What is that? Christ in you, the hope of glory. True godliness will be clearly distinguished. What, do, what were we talking about the whole time? That line of demarcation? How we should have an unmistakable, what did it say? We should have an unmistakable, I forget the word. We should be unmistakably, she said something to the sense of being separated from the world. Unmistakably, she said. She's, now she says here, true godliness will be clearly distinguished from the appearance and tinsel of it. Many a star, many a star, listen to this, speaking of people, people in the church, many a star that we have admired for its brilliancy will then go out in darkness. Chaff, like a cloud, will be borne away on the wind even from places where we see only floors of rich wheat. All who assume the ornaments of the sanctuary but are not clothed with Christ's righteousness will appear in the shame of their own nakedness. She's quoting from the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 16. I'm going to end with this. All of this, what I just said, she's speaking according to the language of what? According to the language of Jeremiah chapter 10, where I quote where it says, the customs of the heathen or the customs of the people and how we should not be following it. And you can read that in your own time. It's a message of paganism. And how I believe she knew that why she spoke the word customs and separating away from it all the time, not being like the world, not being according to the customs of the world, the customs of the people, the customs of the heathen, the customs of the pagan, however your translation might put it. According to Jeremiah chapter 10, she was repeatedly speaking to that context. And so I leave you with that and to think about it. And glory to God, glory to God, glory to God.